You know, there is a severe problem today. It's often left unaddressed and it's ravaging young people, families, and homes. Some people don't even know they are already caught in it. God is sending you this message today. Don't play with fire. Don't get caught in the mix like others. They might call it normal, but you must see it as it really is. A trap meant to lure and destroy great destinies. This issue is the matter of sex. To point it out clearly, sex outside of marriage, either before marriage or apart from the person you are married to, is a sin before God. There is no sugarcoating it. It is the truth, no matter how we twist it to justify ourselves. Today, we don't really talk about lust, fornication, or adultery the way we are supposed to. We avoid these topics so people don't feel judged. This is because society has made sex seem normal. Even though God has clear rules about who sex is meant for, in this video, we'll discuss how lust, fornication, and adultery can trick us. In the Bible, lust is referred to as intense and selfish desire, usually associated with sexual desires, but also applicable to other cravings. In this context, we're discussing sexual desires. Lust is associated with negativity and sin because of its focus on personal gratification over self-control and other higher values. In other words, lust practically gives birth to sin, which leads to spiritual death and separation from God. James 1, 14 through 15, the Amplified Bible. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. Fornication, on the other hand, involves sexual relations between individuals who are not married to each other. It generally refers to unmarried people engaging in sexual activity. Then we have adultery, which refers to a situation where a married person engages in sexual activity with someone other than their spouse, breaking the commitment of fidelity within marriage. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You probably agree that some Christians are fond of attributing everything they or anyone else do to demons. Many things people do are indeed influenced by demons. This is true. However, ultimately, we must all take responsibility for what we do. The truth is that even though a demon may manipulate someone to commit adultery, to fornicate, or carry out any other sin, the person decided to act unless they were possessed. It's not the demon who commits this sin, but the individual. The Bible tells us you don't need a demon to go out and fornicate. It is in your flesh. Literally, the Bible tells us what the works of the flesh are. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We live in a culture saturated with sensuality. We live in a culture that encourages us to do whatever feels good. But the problem is that something feeling good doesn't necessarily mean it's acceptable in the eyes of God. Galatians 5 warns us about giving into our bodies feel-good promptings. There's a problem you and I are faced with. What do you think it is? Our physical bodies can lead us astray, even though our inner selves have been saved when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Just because we've experienced a spiritual transformation, that is, we're born again, doesn't mean we won't face strong temptations from our carnal desires. We often believe that being born again and having the Holy Spirit means we are no longer humans with flesh and blood or fleshly passions for the things of this world that God forbids. 
This creates a conflict between our spirit and our flesh. Our renewed spirit wants to follow God and seek a connection with Him, but our bodies still want to engage in rebellious behaviors. This struggle is what we saw described in Galatians 5. There is a war going on inside every Christian. The spirit versus the flesh. God knows you, my friend. He is aware of that battle within you. There is no need to hide or deny it. Your deliverance begins by exposure to the truth. The Bible says that only the truth can set anyone free. This is why we're instructed to put off the flesh and to put on the new spirit of Christ. We're led to walk in the spirit and not the flesh. There's a war inside you, and if you will admit it, you can feel it too. Paul lamented this in Romans 7, 22 through 24. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Paul talks about the struggle inside every Christian, where part of us wants one thing while another wants something else because of our new life in Christ. Something inside you is trying to take you back to where Christ rescued you from. Your flesh and spirit are in conflict, so you cannot do whatever you want. If you're under the spirit of God and bought by the blood of Jesus, you're not allowed to live by the flesh. That is no longer your lifestyle. People who aren't following Christ don't have this struggle because they are focused on their physical desires and controlled by the flesh. This struggle between our physical desires and our spirit is important. It provides that we are alive and God lives inside us. The desire to break the grip of sexual sin is the godly desire and proof of hope for you. The key is prioritizing our spiritual side, but it can be complicated. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, David was not demon-possessed, he chose to act in the flesh. Our flesh craves sex, and that is entirely normal and natural. People attempt to demonize sex and make it look like an evil thing. However, permit me to tell you that sex in itself is not evil or wrong. It is a beautiful union that God has created for one man and one woman to engage in within marriage but our sinful nature attempts to get sex outside of marriage. The world encourages us to have sex outside the constraints of marriage because it wants us to dishonor God. So it's okay to feel like your body wants to have sex, but we make a mistake when we do it outside of the rules that God gave us. God's laws are simple. One man and one woman should be married to have sex. When people break these rules, they let their desires control them. God made these rules to protect us from bad things that can happen to our bodies and spirits because of sex. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Listen, whenever you engage in sex with someone, you're joining yourself with that person in the spirit. You're literally saying we are one. You may observe two people in a relationship involved in premarital sex, and the relationship is so negative and toxic. And you ask yourself, why don't they just go their separate ways if things are so terrible between them? Do you know that they want to leave? They know they're not good for each other, but they can't leave. Why not? Because it's not that simple, my friend. There's a connection between the two of them that transcends their physical relationship. They've been joined together in their spirits. They've become one. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? These are not my words, but God's words. Why do you think breakups are often very difficult? When a sexually active relationship ends, you will feel confused like something important has been removed from your life. And it's true that something has been taken away. A piece of who you are is with that person. 
and a part of that person stayed with you, do you know that unless you prayerfully break that connection, if you two see each other again, even years later, those emotions will be stirred up. This has led to many families breaking because old sex partners couldn't keep themselves from going back to their lovers. Some people are already married to someone new, but still miss their old partner from more than 10 years ago. Others who are married sometimes remember their former lovers from long ago and crave them. Why do you think this is? It's because they have become one flesh with them. In this situation, you often hear the saying, time heals all wounds. But permit me to tell you that's not entirely true. The effects of sexual intimacy with someone apart from your spouse don't heal over time unless you prayerfully ask God to break you free from them. Time does not heal spiritual things. So you might still find yourself grappling with the pain of that breakup or that encounter you had years later. God created sex. God loves you. And for these very reasons, he has made these specific parameters for two people to have sex. God cares and God's laws are for your benefit. God knows the consequences of people living in a promiscuous lifestyle. And time and time again, he warns us against this lifestyle. So there's nothing wrong with you wanting sex. However, it's meant to be obtained through the parameters set by God. Lust can often bring temporary pleasure, but it ultimately leaves you empty and unsatisfied. It distorts your thoughts and leads you to prioritize your own desires over the well-being of others. Fornication goes against God's design for intimacy. It can lead to emotional pain, broken trust, and the devaluation of the sacred union between a husband and a wife. And lastly, adultery deeply wounds the spouse and the bond of trust within marriage. It can lead to lasting consequences in the fracture of the intimate bond that God desires for couples. Decide today to emulate Joseph's resolve and refrain from engaging in these activities, even in the face of temptation. Genesis 39, 7. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. While the temptation to yield might exist, remember that the Holy Spirit resides within us, guiding us toward fulfilling his intentions. Firmly commit to abstinence and honoring the marital bond. But above all, dedicate yourself to pleasing the Father. The battle of lust is a common challenge to all believers. The question is, are you unapologetic about sexual sinning? Or do you want to be a victor of purity in each struggle? This message can be hard to listen to, but you need to hear it anyway. In 1 Timothy 5.22, the Bible says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Purity for Christians requires abstaining from sexual relations outside of marriage, either in premarital sex or adultery. The latter means you're having lustful affairs with someone you're not married to. The word of the Lord is the only thing that separates believers from the world, don't you think? We adhere to God's teachings when most people would blindly follow the world. So when you choose to submit yourself to lust and engage in sexual immorality, who are you really following? What are you really after? God's kingdom or the enemy's approval? You may think, well, it wouldn't hurt anyone. What would be so wrong about it? It's the kind of thinking that gives the devil a golden ticket into your heart and mind. These sexual sins may not physically hurt someone, but I can assure you that they hugely impact your emotional identity and character. Above all, you're putting your relationship with God at risk. Purity is not a random command. It reflects God's love and respect for you. I'll tell you more about this in a while. I want to share how the devil attempts to overpower the Holy Spirit in you by driving you toward the sins of lust. First, he wants you to think that following Christ is sacrificial. What do I mean by this? Well, a common belief is that fun and pleasurable activities are the ones that are often discouraged. 
Whether it's wildly partying, staying up late at night, or dating without genuine intentions, these are some of the things that the world enjoys. For some reason, people can't seem to let go of habits even if they don't do any good. People can't stop cursing, fantasizing, and all other immoral behaviors that bring them pleasure and self-gratification. 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. But because we live our lives patterned after God's teachings, purity is one of the defining virtues. The Bible teaches us not to engage in indecent activities, especially with someone we're not married to. We keep ourselves pure for a very good reason. God wants us to respect ourselves and our future partner. He wants us to treat our bodies with the utmost care because we're literally the temple of His Holy Spirit. However, the devil wants you to think that you're missing out on all the fun and pleasurable things. He makes you focus on the false idea that you're sacrificing your pleasure. Look around you. Do you notice how almost everyone offline and online is open and active in sexual activities? In your friend group, does anyone share their sexual escapades outside of marriage? The enemy will surround you with contempt and people who encourage these immoral activities to make you feel curious. Once you're exposed to so many stories, this curiosity tends to turn to temptation. The devil will lure you in once you feel even a tiny ounce of jealousy towards your peers that openly give in to lust. When you think of keeping yourself pure as a sacrifice, you will inevitably feel envious of the people who conform to the ways of the world. The enemy will grab this chance immediately and persuade you to distance yourself from God's grace. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son in the book of Luke? When the son came back because of his failed attempt to live independently, the father celebrated, which made the older son furious. He felt that it was unfair to lavishly celebrate the return of his brother when he was the one who stayed by their father's side and didn't even get a single goat to recognize his faithfulness. You see that this is the same thing the devil wants you to feel. He wants you to believe that your efforts to avoid sexual sins are pointless and that following God means depriving yourself of gratification. You may start to question, why are my sexually active friends still blessed and doing okay while I have to give up that pleasure for God? Don't ever fall for this. The most important thing for you to remember is that there is no loss in obeying God's command. You may think that lust doesn't bring any detrimental effects, but it permanently scars one's well-being and relationships with other people. Matthew 5, 8 proclaims, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You're not giving anything up. You're keeping yourself respectable and holy for God's glorious plans. You're setting yourself up to meet our Creator and gain eternal life. In Philippians 4, 8, God says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He instructs us to think about anything and any one of these qualities because this is exactly the way He thinks of us. God's asking you to keep your focus on these things because these are what you deserve to have. You, my friend, are meant to be true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. This is what God is preparing you to be. Romans 13, 14 reads, Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh demands to be desired while our soul yearns for God. Yes, it's definitely a challenge. Temptations will creep in at any given chance, but you need to hold on to God's promises. The next tactic of the devil is heightening your ego so that you won't be able to confess this sin and ask for forgiveness. Let's say that you've committed the mentioned sexual sins. 
The enemy's next strategy to make sure that you can't run back to God is making you believe that you're not worthy anymore. You'll be consumed by guilt, and you can't deny that there's a chance you'd do it again. This makes it hard to ask for forgiveness. If you feel this way, that's your pride talking. That's Satan trying to convince you to stay sinful. I want to take this moment to remind you that our God is a forgiving God. If you don't know what to say or do, a prayer in Psalm 51.10 goes, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Honestly, this is the simplest way of asking for forgiveness. Utter the short prayer with the utmost sincerity, and I promise that the Lord will redeem you. He will renew you. As long as you promise to learn from the setback, God is quick to forgive. All you have to do is communicate. Psalm 119, 9-10 tells us, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. No one has a pure heart all the time, but the beauty in following God is that we keep trying. We strive to bounce back from our mistakes and humble ourselves before the Lord. So what makes you think he won't grant you forgiveness? Do you not believe me? Take a look at King David. He committed adultery, and if that wasn't enough, he authorized a murder to cover his tracks. At first, he was unapologetic. But when a prophet made him aware of the sins he'd committed, David immediately prayed to God. His prayer consisted of three parts, a plea for mercy, acknowledgement of his faults, and a request for his heart to be cleansed by the Lord. Having said this, we should know that every sin starts from within, which means that repentance requires asking God to restore the purity in our hearts. Do this with me, brothers and sisters. At this very moment, confess everything to God. Whether you do it verbally or mentally, declare your intention of being pure again. Urgency is very important when asking God to help you repent because this sends a message that you're deeply remorseful about sinning against him and yourself. If you let time pass by, it shows that you think you don't need God's mercy. It's a sign of disrespect to his authority. There you have it, the devil's two-point action plan to destroy you through sexual immorality. The enemy tempts you so hard, and once you cave in, he'll gaslight you into thinking that there's no second chance available in God's kingdom. But now you know that this can never be true, right? I'll tell you this, nothing compares to the promises of God. Committing sexual sins will give you temporary gratification, and that's just about it. You may feel some kind of satisfaction, and then what? Would you really let the devil destroy God's work in you in exchange for short-term pleasure? As told in 1 Corinthians 10.13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will provide a way out so that you can endure it. The devil can destroy you, if and only if you let him. You're equipped with the wisdom you need to reject these temptations. And even if you think otherwise, God will never leave you to face this challenge alone. The Lord's always ready to help you fight this battle. A life in Christ is a life well lived. It's far more pleasurable than anything the devil will try to offer you. Respect the honor God has bestowed upon you and actively repel the calling of the flesh. Temptation and desires will fade, but God's promises will remain until the end of time. What if I told you there's a spirit that affects people without them realizing it? What if I told you that many people are living under the influence of this ancient spirit without knowing it? This spirit has influenced people in the past and still controls many in modern times. It might surprise you, but I'm talking about the spirit of Jezebel. Saints, Jesus strongly warned the church about the Jezebel spirit cautioning believers to be wary of her teachings, seduction, and immoral behavior. In Revelation 2, 20-22, Jesus expressed his concern. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, 
who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. The name Jezebel has become synonymous with evil, influence, and control. Using it to describe someone today could be considered a severe insult, reflecting the negative perception associated with the biblical figure. Interestingly, the name Jezebel is so strongly linked to these negative qualities that, to this day, it's rare for anyone to name their child Jezebel. In today's video, I'll be discussing Queen Jezebel, who significantly influenced her husband Ahab, leading to the downfall of the nation of Israel. We'll delve into the spirit of Jezebel and how it prompts individuals to defy God's laws and His will. Before we explore further, Let's go back to the background of Israel and understand how Jezebel became a pivotal figure. Her story unfolds in the book of 1 Kings. The nation of Israel witnessed various kings, starting with Saul, the inaugural king, followed by David, considered the best king in Israel's history. After David, his son Solomon, renowned for his wisdom, took the throne. However, following Solomon's death, the nation split into two kingdoms, the northern one called Jerusalem and the southern one known as Judah. After this division, peace was scarce in Israel. Most kings ruling during this time were wicked, neglecting God's guidance. Instead, they turned to other gods, engaging in idolatry and leading the people astray. The situation worsened when Ahab ascended to the throne earning a reputation as the worst king in Israel's history, largely due to the negative influence of his wicked wife, Jezebel. As we delve in deeper, let us understand a little bit about Jezebel. This will help you understand the spirit of Jezebel and how to be wary of her. Who was Jezebel? Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, lived in a time when her father, a king and priest of the idolatrous god Baal in Tyre, committed heinous acts, including killing her own brother to seize the throne. Unfortunately, Jezebel inherited her father's negative traits, becoming power-driven and cruel. She was a ruthless murderer who pursued her desires relentlessly. Her upbringing by a wicked father significantly influenced her character. Ahab, seeking greater influence, married Jezebel, who brought hundreds of Baal priests to Israel with her. Jezebel's dominance was so pronounced that she emerged as the master and controller of her weak husband, Ahab. Baal, a prominent deity in Canaan and Phoenicia, was associated with fertility, believed to bring forth and produce from the earth and enable the conception of children. The worship of Baal, however, involved sensuality and ritualistic prostitution with instances of human sacrifice, as condemned in Jeremiah 19.5. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. One of Jezebel's heinous acts was the order to kill all God's prophets. Her intense hatred for God led her to single-handedly orchestrate the deaths of these men of God. Despite Ahab's disobedience, he still retained some reverence for God and could not bring himself to carry out such a dreadful act. Jezebel's persecution of God's prophets was so severe that a righteous man named Obadiah hid about a hundred prophets in a cave, secretly providing for them for an extended period. In another impactful story, Naboth, a God-serving farmer, firmly declined selling his vineyard to King Ahab, fearing it would displease God. Ahab, frustrated by Naboth's refusal, returned to the palace, where his wife, Jezebel, devised a plan to falsely accuse Naboth of blasphemy and treason against the king, resulting in him being stoned to death. The tragic end of Naboth's life highlighted Jezebel's manipulation over Ahab, portraying him as nothing more than a puppet under her control. However, Jezebel faced formidable opposition from God's prophet Elijah. 
he resisted her orders and confronted her evil rule. Elijah first declared God's punishment on Israel, a three and a half year drought. This led to a renowned contest on Mount Carmel between the Almighty God and the priests of Baal and Asherah. Despite the priests' fervent attempts to end the drought and call down fire through self-inflicted injuries, Elijah's prayer to God brought an immediate response, consuming the sacrifice and bringing an abundant rain to Israel that very day. Elijah then commanded the execution of 850 priests of Baal and Asherah. Instead of acknowledging God's power and repenting, Jezebel vowed to kill Elijah. Her death was exceptionally gruesome, serving as a lesson to others. Even facing imminent death, Jezebel remained defiant. Adorned in queenly garments, shouting her defiance to Yehu, the next king of Israel, Yehu ordered her thrown out through the window, and she perished, trampled by horses' hooves and nearly consumed by dogs, ending her thirty years of tyranny over Israel in a miserable manner. Though Jezebel has been gone for thousands of years, her spirit endures. The Jezebel spirit, a formidable demon, seeks to dominate, influence, and control people against their will, manipulating them into actions they wouldn't ordinarily take. It is characterized by immorality, idolatry, false teaching, and unrepentant sin, mirroring the actions of historical Jezebel. The Bible wisely advises, in Proverbs 13.20, to walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. This implies that we need to be cautious about the company we keep. If we associate with wicked and harmful individuals, the likelihood of making poor decisions will increase. This is why the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 6, 14-17, warns believers against being closely connected with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness share? Can light and darkness coexist? How can Christ and Belial find common ground? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Can the temple of God align with idols? We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Avoid anything unclean, and I will welcome you. In simpler terms, don't team up with those who don't share your beliefs. Righteousness and wickedness don't mix, just like light and darkness. It's like trying to mix Christ with evil. Believers and unbelievers are like oil and water. They don't blend. We're God's temple, and He dwells among us. So God tells us to break away from them, stay away from anything impure, and He'll embrace us. Beloved, in essence, the Bible encourages believers to choose their companions wisely, steering clear of those whose values and beliefs oppose theirs for the sake of maintaining a righteous and godly life. Let me ask you, who are those people you surround yourself with? Do you have a positive influence over you? Do you even know how much influence they have over you? Or do you just concern yourself with having fun with them? As believers, we shouldn't get too close with those who don't share our faith. We're already connected to Christ, so there's no need to tie ourselves again to unbelievers. Let me ask you again, my friend, who do you allow into your life? As a Christian, it's crucial to be mindful of the people you let in. Are they uplifting your faith and guiding you to a closer relationship with the Lord? Or are they extinguishing even the smallest bit of faith you have in God? Consider your friends and your inner circle. If they aren't bringing you closer to God, they might be pulling you away. There's no in-between in this matter, no sitting on the fence. Now, the spirit of Jezebel is often linked to sex, seduction, and promiscuity. And this is indeed true. These outward displays are just a few ways this satanic spirit shows itself. That's why many young people might not realize why fashion seems to be designed to be seductive, intentionally revealing sensitive parts of the body to make them objects of seduction. It's spiritual manipulation, even if you're not aware of it. 
Moreover, many young people find themselves entangled in various forms of sexual promiscuity, another manifestation of the spirit of Jezebel. Look around, and you'll notice that there's an overwhelming pervasiveness around sex today. Please know that sex is a beautiful gift from God within the bounds of marital vows. Anything outside of this is against God's plan and considered a sin. Unfortunately, many young people today fall into the trap of addictions like pornography, masturbation, phone sex, and more. I don't want you, dear friend, to be deceived by the manipulative spirit of Jezebel, as these behaviors are the result of its influence. This is another characteristic of the spirit of Jezebel. Aside from being manipulative, it traps people in the web of addiction, like a spider ensnaring its prey. Another thing you should know is that contradictory to common belief, the spirit of Jezebel isn't limited to any gender. Just because it's named after a woman doesn't mean it only affects women. It can equally manipulate and entangle men in its deceptions. It also doesn't mean it's a female spirit, because in the spirit there is neither male nor female. The reason it's called the Jezebel spirit is that it operates like Jezebel did, seductive, manipulative, and destructive, targeting God's people, especially those in great positions of power. If you find yourself constantly driven by the desire for power and the need to control those around you, it's a sign that this spirit might be at play. It's the root cause of many conflicts at home, at church, or in the workplace. It sneaks in by making someone crave control over others, while manipulating that person over whom it's influencing. It also hardens the heart of others, creating disagreements among people. Saints, it's crucial not to attempt to control people, but rather lead them through the example you set. This way, people will naturally be influenced by your leadership. Take God, our Heavenly Father, as an example. He doesn't force us to do anything. He demonstrates love, mercy, and all virtues. That's quality leadership. God wants us all saved, yet He doesn't compel anyone. Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. Instead of breaking in, he awaits the moment we come and invite him in. We must follow in this step, and not force ourselves or our will on others. In conclusion, my friend, the spirit of Jezebel is a powerful and sinister spirit that can cause unseen damage in individual lives, communities, or organizations. However, God's power through Jesus Christ given to us believers, is far stronger than any force in the world, including that of the spirit of Jezebel. As 1 John 4.4 4 assures, You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Beloved, God's spirit in you is more powerful than all the evil spirits and demons combined. With confidence, I believe you can overcome the influence of the manipulative spirit of Jezebel and be free in all aspects of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. It is better to give than to receive. Are you familiar with this saying? You're probably too familiar. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. And because we live our lives pleasing our Creator, we give and give and give you must have been pouring your heart out at every opportunity to bless other people. However, there is a slight problem in being used to giving our all because we tend to receive leniently. We accept almost anything and everything that comes our way because we naturally feel that we are being rewarded for our good deeds. We have an optimistic outlook and perceive that these rewards are gifts from our God when in actuality, they're not. Let me tell you about knockoffs. These are items that are replicas of the original ones. You can see these anywhere, especially places selling phones, luxury bags, clothes, and other commodities. These items, despite not being authentic, still generate profit because the people who buy them aren't willing to pay for the real thing. 
people would patronize knockoffs because they think they're getting the better deal. Considering that these items look and function the same as the originals, it all looks good, but what they don't realize is that knockoffs most likely are low quality. They're cheaper, but when one breaks and you have to replace it multiple times, you don't actually save money in the long run. I'm sharing this with you because Satan is quite literally a purveyor of knockoffs. He will use people to give you gifts that imitate the kinds of gifts God showers us with. And once you accept them and fall into a scheme, the devil will have the chance to slowly intrude into your life. I'm going to tell you the first way the devil mimics the Lord by tempting you with gifts that can cost you your relationship with Jesus. You know this already, but I want to reiterate. Satan is the biggest imitator of God. He believes that he can rule the world just like our father. This is why he constantly pursues our hearts and persuades us to conform to his methods, which are the ways of the world. Isaiah 14, 14 shows how Satan aspires to have God's power, where he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. But since God has given us his Holy Spirit and has taught us the true and proper way of living, Satan's puzzle was figuring out how to trick us. So he targets our hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 proclaims that, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The whole point of following Christ is that our hearts aren't as pure as his yet, and so we are on a journey to be like him. Our hearts are sinful by nature, but God loves us deeply, so we strive to follow in his footsteps. That sums up our relationship with him. We sin, and he never stops loving us, which is why we repent and bounce back every time. Satan's plan is to lure you into his sinful kingdom by targeting your fragile heart. His strategy is to entice you with a gift that is too good for your heart to resist, brought by people who you can hardly say no to. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, God is vocal about looking out for us. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. The devil knows better than to just lay out literal gifts in front of you, such as indecent tangible objects. Although there will be physical gifts, which I'll talk about later on, it's important for you to know that he will mostly give you gifts that seemingly satisfy your desires as an individual. Our hearts can make us the most vulnerable. So it's our duty to keep our guard up and raise awareness on how the enemy attacks our hearts. As Daniel 12.3 tells us, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Here's what you should be aware of first. What does a human heart desire the most? And how does the devil use people? Number one, we have the gift of connection. Now, this gift tends to be the most valuable because it involves being validated and loved and gives a sense of belonging. However, when this is brought by a person sent by the devil, chaos begins. Connection is desirable, but not always genuine. And even some people in the Bible learned that the hard way. Take Samson as an example. He immensely desired a relationship with Delilah to the point where he had to spill his biggest secret just to keep her. People have this insatiable need for social relationships, so they sometimes accept everything given to them with open arms without considering the possible effects on their spiritual journey. A gift of friendship is accepted despite being offered through ungodly ways. A possible gift of love? Some people would unbox and own this immediately even without God's blessing. Our hearts are weak whenever we're given the chance to engage in this particular gift. God knows this weakness, and so he warns us in Colossians 3, 23 through 24, by saying, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Number two, we have the gift of success. Everybody wants to be successful, some associate it with having luxurious items like cars and houses, while some think of it as having power or authority. 
Some people are willing to grab every opportunity that can get them the success from literally anyone who will offer, including those with evil intentions. Are you familiar with fencing? I'm not referring to the sport, but rather a criminal activity that involves selling goods that were stolen or obtained illegally. Buying a stolen item is punishable by law in some countries because the business is clearly spoiled with malicious intent. In the same way, when you accept so-called opportunities from people sent by the devil, you are indirectly making a deal with the enemy. These people will deceive you into thinking that they're offering you a shortcut to success in exchange for your purity and commitment to life with Christ. As you know, God always reminds us that he will shower us with blessings only if we continue to seek his kingdom. God advocates for the power of patience, and so his followers are continuously tested in this particular skill. However, the difficulty of staying patient for a reward tends to conquer people's hearts. They often look for an easier route to success, and the devil loves it when a believer seems lost and impatient. When Satan is offering you the gift of success, it can look like an opportunity that brings you away from God's grace. For example, you might have been unemployed for some time now, and a job offer comes knocking at your door, but the responsibilities of this job are not in line with God's teachings. Believe me, there are careers that completely depend on sinful foundations. But because the job comes with irresistible compensation, some people see this as a blessing. Whenever you are invited to receive something that would help you advance on your path, learn to consult with our Father. Some opportunities are doorways to the devil's schemes. On the other hand, let this message be a guide in receiving material gifts. James 1.17 proclaims, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Witchcraft is still practiced today, and material gifts are often the means used by wicked people to have a negative impact on your life. When you are given a random gift by someone you don't fully trust, it's best to leave it somewhere far from you and your home. In no way am I telling you to discriminate or act hostily towards these people. I'm saying that you need to be extra careful because the devil can insert himself into any possible situation. Even if the giver is completely innocent, Satan may play a role somewhere in between and turn the gift into something demonic. The devil is stubborn and resourceful like that. See, you're not obliged to screen everything and everyone on your own. Most of the time, God needs you to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit tells you. When you know how generous and rewarding God is to his believers, you can never be tempted by the devil's offers. Hebrews 11.6 reads, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Who gifted kingship to someone underestimated like David? Who rewarded an esteemed position to a slave and disowned family member like Joseph? Not only does God give rewards, but glorious ones at that. The devil's gifts are temporary and phony, while the rewards God has for you are greater than anything the human mind can imagine. Listen, God is on your team. Receiving gifts from the devil equates to giving him permission to destroy God's work in you. It's a direct betrayal against the Lord, and trust me, that he won't be pleased when he learns that you're teaming up with the enemy. Not all gifts are blessings. If a gift that is being given to you has even a tiny splash of unpleasantness, reject it immediately. You'd be surprised to know that the devil can occasionally use people just to wreak havoc in your relationship with Christ. Daisuku Ikeda once said, there is nothing more vulnerable, nothing more corruptible than the human heart, nor is there anything as powerful, steadfast, and ennobled. Let this sink in. If you set your heart after God's own and practice the skill of analyzing the hidden messages of the gifts that are being presented to you, you will be able to steer clear of traps in disguise. Remember to stay committed to the fact that the best gift you will ever receive is from God which is eternal life. Nothing, nothing can ever come close to this reward.
So make sure to continuously look for God's presence every time you're asked to receive something. What if I told you that every choice we make in life has an impact? These outcomes can be positive or negative. Regardless of the result, it's crucial to recognize that our choices can reach beyond ourselves and affect the people in our lives, both now and in the future. That's why it's so important to be mindful of the decisions we make. In this video, I want to share a surprising story from the Bible found in Judges chapter 19. It's a tale that will truly astonish you, and you might not have expected to find it in the Bible. I'll also discuss two important lessons we can learn from this story. But before we continue, I need to mention that this video may not be suitable for children and could bring up difficult memories of past experiences with any form of sexual abuse. However, we believe that the lessons shared will be a source of great blessing for you and those around you. Let's get started. In the book of Judges, chapters 19 through 21, the Bible tells a sorrowful tale about a man and his concubine. It all starts in Judges, chapter 19, verses 1 to 3. The story goes like this. There was a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim. He took a concubine from Bethlehem to Judah. Sadly, this concubine was unfaithful and left him to go back to her father's house in Bethlehem, where she stayed for four months. The Levite, being a responsible husband, decided to go after her to speak to her kindly and bring her back. He took his servant and a couple of donkeys for the journey. When they arrived, the concubine brought him into her father's house, and her father was pleased to see him. The father urged them to stay, and they ended up spending three days there, eating, drinking, and sleeping. Because of the father's hospitality, they kept delaying their return to Ephraim. They tried to leave a few times, but the girl's father convinced them to stay for one more night. However, on a particular day, the Levite made up his mind to leave and respectfully informed the father that they had to go back and wouldn't be staying any longer. So even though it was late in the day for such a journey, they set out on their way. After they set out on their journey, they were near Jerusalem and it was getting late. The servant suggested to the Levite, let's turn into this city of the Jebusites and spend the night there. But the Levite refused, saying, we won't stay in a city of foreigners who aren't Israelites. We'll go on to Gibeah. So they continued their journey past Jerusalem and arrived in Gibeah, a city belonging to Benjamin, late at night. They tried to find a place to stay, but no one would take them in because they were strangers. The Levite, his concubine, servant, and donkeys ended up staying on the street. Then an old man who was from the hill country of Ephraim and temporarily living in Gibeah where all the locals were Benjamites, came in from his day's work in the fields. When he saw the travelers on the street, he asked them where they were going and where they were from. The Levite explained that they were traveling from Bethlehem to the hill country of Ephraim, but because they were strangers, no one had offered them a place to stay for the night. The old man then invited them in to spend the night with him, assuring them that he would take care of all their needs and urging them not to spend the night on the street. Then the story takes a dramatic turn when in Judges chapter 19, verse 22, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house, pounding on the door. They shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. It's a surprising and troubling twist, isn't it? The old man went out to them and pleaded, please, no, don't do such a wicked thing. This man is my guest so please don't harm him. Instead, here's my virgin daughter and his concubine. You can have them and do whatever you want to them, but please don't commit this terrible act against this man. Sadly, the men didn't listen to the old man. He then took his concubine and brought her out to them. They abused her all night until morning, and when dawn broke, they let her go. She then collapsed at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. When the Levite woke up and opened the doors of the house to leave, he found his concubine lying at the door, dead. 
He tried to rouse her, but she didn't respond. So he placed her on a donkey and continued on his journey. When he arrived home in Ephraim, the Levite did a shocking thing. He took a knife, cut his concubine into 12 pieces along with her bones, and sent the pieces to all the territories of Israel. Everyone who saw this said, Nothing like this has ever been seen or done, from the day the Israelites left Egypt until now. The Levite also wrote letters to all 12 tribes of Israel, explaining what had happened to him in Gabeah. Surprisingly, the Benjamites denied it, claiming that nothing like that had occurred, and even defended their fellow tribesmen's terrible actions. Now, let's pause and reflect on some important issues from the story. Consider the first few words of the first verse of chapter 19, which says, In those days, Israel had no king. The story teaches us that lawlessness and godlessness are the root causes of evil in the world today. When people believe that they can do whatever they think is right without considering moral laws, it leads to chaos. The primary issue in this story is not the absence of a king in Israel, but rather the nation's neglect of the laws given by God. Their failure to implement and enforce these laws resulted from their lack of godliness. A godless society will always lead to lawlessness, which is dangerous for everyone. Many people today want to live without considering God, believing that it restricts them. However, this mindset only leads to lawlessness. The pursuit of freedom often comes with a price, and seeking freedom without moral boundaries can result in a godless and lawless world. God's laws are meant to protect us and guide us, and they're not burdensome for those willing to obey them. As a society distances itself from God, the moral fabric begins to unravel, and lawlessness and unethical behavior become more prevalent. Israel's situation where they lacked a king and everyone did what they believed was right to do and faced the consequences serves as a crucial example that neglecting the laws given by God cannot be justified. The men of Gabeah's violation of fundamental commandments, such as those against adultery and coveting, illustrates the dire consequences of disregarding moral principles. When a society fails to uphold a clear distinction between good and evil, the repercussions reverberate through future generations. The prevailing moral compass becomes skewed, as it's based on the definitions and actions of preceding generations. This perpetuates a cycle where the understanding of morality becomes increasingly compromised, leading to a society that's fraught with ethical challenges and moral ambiguity. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if we don't take our stand today and call evil evil, the generation after us will see evil as good. The events in Judges chapter 19 to 21 depict a nation gradually turning away from God. Similarly, in our time, there's a gradual deviation from God's ways, with behaviors like pornography and nudity becoming normalized, leading to increased instances of sexual assault. Sin has consequences, and the most concerning aspect is that we can't control the repercussions of sin. This leads us to the second lesson. The second lesson from this story is that sin has serious consequences. The story doesn't conclude in chapter 19, but in chapters 20 and 21 of the book of Judges. The actions of a few people in Gibeah led to a war between the 11 other tribes and the tribe of Benjamin. It's important to note that not all the people of Gibeah were responsible for the atrocious act. Yet the consequences extended beyond Gibeah to affect Benjamin and the entire nation of Israel. This civil war resulted in the deaths of over 65,000 people from the tribe of Benjamin alone. Gibeah and other cities were destroyed, and the population suffered great losses, almost leading to the obliteration of an entire tribe. Defending evil and wickedness comes at a great cost, as those who defend such behavior share in the guilt and may face divine retribution. The consequences of sin should never be underestimated. Due to the heinous acts in Gibeah, the tribe of Benjamin was left with only 600 men in Israel. The other tribes, concerned for the future of Benjamin, sought a solution since they had vowed not to give their daughters to the tribe of Benjamin. 
they found that the men of Jabesh Gilead had not participated in the war, so they sent 12,000 men to war against Jabesh Gilead and provided 400 virgins to the surviving Benjamites. However, this was still not enough, as there were 600 men and they needed more wives. The people were distressed for Benjamin, and they devised a plan for the men of Benjamin to seize wives for themselves during a festival in Shiloh. This desperate situation demonstrates the far-reaching consequences of sin and the lengths to which people will go to address its aftermath. This is the thing with sin. You only know the beginning, but can't determine the end. The nature of sin is such that its consequences are unpredictable and far-reaching. Many people who struggle with habits today don't start out with those habits. They likely begin with something subtle and light, only to find themselves trapped in destructive patterns. What began as rape and abuse escalated to the murder of the Levite's concubine, then led to the deaths of many Israelites in the war with the tribe of Benjamin, and ultimately resulted in the deaths of over 65,000 Benjamites. Additionally, it led to the death of the men of Jabesh Gilead and even the kidnapping of young women attending the Shiloh festival. My dear friend, when you feel a prompting from the Holy Spirit to stop a wrong action, it's important to heed that prompting and reconsider your decisions. Even seemingly harmless behaviors, like viewing soft pornographic images on the internet, can lead to more serious actions such as masturbation, fornication, adultery, and even worse. It's crucial to be mindful of your decisions and actions, as the consequences of sin can be severe and difficult to manage. I encourage you to be thoughtful and considerate in your choices, and to be aware of the deceptive nature of temptation. The repercussions of sin are not just earthly consequences, but also spiritual separation from God. Just as Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 declares, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. It's therefore important to be cautious and attentive, to avoid falling into the traps of sin and opening the door to the devil to wreak havoc on us or those around us.